This program is about unsolved mysteries. Whenever possible, the actual family members and police officials have participated in recreating the events. What you are about to see is not a news broadcast. In 1991, a weekend fishing trip off the coast of Mexico apparently ended in a tragic death for four young Americans. But two of the bodies were never recovered. Ever since, repeated sightings of a strange young man have been reported up and down Mexico's Baja Peninsula, convincing many that one of the victims, Gordon Collins, is still alive and suffering from amnesia. Tonight, Gordon Collins' family needs your help. Perhaps you hold the crucial clue that can bring their son back home. Join me for this intriguing new case and more on another edition of Unsolved Mysteries. In the 1940s and 50s, a mysterious and terrifying epidemic swept the United States, polio. The victims were almost all children. Thousands died. Thousands more were crippled for life. In 1952, Dr. Jonas Salk developed a vaccine against polio. It was nothing short of a miracle. But for many children, it was a miracle that came too late. Such was a case for Judy Davis of Beverly, Ohio. Judy was just five years old in 1949 when both her legs were hopelessly crippled by polio. My attitude toward the polio was, it was a challenge. My parents decided that I was going to live as normal a life as possible. And regardless, the doctors wanted to put me in a convalescent center. And my mother just hit the roof. She says, no way that child is going to live as normal as possible. And I did. When she was eight, Judy was enrolled in a special elementary school. Then at the age of 12, she entered a regular school where her braces and crutches provoked fear, stares, and uncomfortable giggles. September 1956, the first day of junior high for Judy Davis. Here, Judy would be the only handicapped student. Here she would, for the first time, face a world which might be unintentionally cruel. I was petrified because I didn't know anyone in the school. So I was really petrified. Oh, my father, he was the type of person who encouraged me to do things for myself. And he kind of instilled in me that there was nothing I couldn't do as long as I tried. Daddy, I want to do it myself. OK, honey. I was able to, to get in and out of the car by myself. And I would have been able to climb the stairs to the school if there was a railing, but there was no railing. So I was resolved to let my father carry me into the school. It's okay, honey. Seeing all the kids stare at me when I entered the school, it was really an awkward feeling because I was it was something new for me, and I'd never had that before. My father carried me up the steps and sat me down. 
at the top of the stairs and this girl comes over and she says, Hi, I'm Becky. Can I help? Thanks. Well, what homeroom are you in? The letter said 102. <laughs> That's the same one I'm in. It's Mr. Hopkins. He's pretty good. Come on, I'll show you. Okay. Bye, Daddy. Bye, honey. Judy had made a real friend. In the weeks that followed, she and Becky Terry would become inseparable. Becky was a very warm person, very warm, very outgoing. I mean, she had to be to, to be so open with me the first day of school. But the other kids in the school, it was like I was an alien from outer space. And I, I, I felt that way, except when Becky was around. Around Becky, I felt like everything was possible. She made me feel like I, there was no braces, there was no crutches, that I was just like her. All through seventh grade, the girls' friendship grew. In eighth grade, Becky and Judy even took to coordinating their wardrobes. They were often mistaken for sisters, and in fact, no sisters could have been closer. <laughs> Becky and I talked about music, we talked about boys, we talked about marriage, we talked about everything under the sun. But Judy and Becky's favorite subject was definitely boys. <laughs> at the junior high, serialized horror movies were shown each day at noon. Before long, a boy began sitting next to Becky. All of a sudden, he wasn't just sitting there, he was holding Becky's hand. <laughs> Knowing Becky had a boyfriend was, I don't know, it was kind of sad for me because she had a boyfriend and I didn't have a boyfriend. So I felt kind of left out. Becky's boyfriend was David Major, a fellow seventh grader. But Judy was so shy that she couldn't bring herself to talk to David or to any other boy. Judy, I can't help you tote your books. Why? Well, one day Becky had a big load of books and she wasn't able to carry my books on top of her books. I'll be fine. Are you sure? I mean, get David or one of those other boys to help you. They're right there. I can't ask boys. Yes, you can if it means you might fall. I'll be fine. Are you sure? I'm sure. I was so shy, I would rather have died than to ask a boy for help. I was very shy at that age, especially around boys. So here I was trying to carry maybe three or four books, plus pencils and a notebook, and they fell all over the floor. Oh, here, let's help you with that. I had a class with David, so I knew who David was even before Becky and he became involved. And shortly after Becky and David became an item, they broke up. And uh, Becky decided she liked this boy named Gordon, and evidently he liked her because they started holding hands in the movies and David started holding my hand in the movies. So I was really thrilled about that. It was real exciting, because now we both had boyfriends. A few months later, Becky came to Judy's house in a somber mood. The girls had been through everything two friends could experience, except separation. Been really awful. My dad got a job. But that's good. It's in West Virginia. We're moving. Moving? We're moving tomorrow. He says it can't wait. Tomorrow? No. 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 I was broken hearted when Becky told me she was leaving. 
Becky's friendship to me meant that I was able to be accepted by the other students in the school. And it made me feel like I was more like everyone else and that there was no difference between us. And at the age of 12, that meant a lot. And it still means a lot. Becky and Judy wrote to each other for several years, and Becky even came back to visit once. But eventually, they lost touch. In 1960, Judy's condition deteriorated, and she was confined to a wheelchair. Nevertheless, Judy went on to marry and have four children. She also became an outspoken advocate for the rights of the disabled. In 1979, Judy divorced and later moved to Tucson, Arizona. Through it all, her friendship with Becky has been an inspiration. I would really like to find Becky. I'd kind of like to tell her how, how much she meant to me as a friend, and I'd like to get that friendship back if it's possible. September 1991, a young American, disoriented, penniless, and obviously out of place, wandered into the Mexican village of Colonia Vicente Guerrero, 300 miles south of San Diego, California. He lingered for months, living on handouts, depending on the charity of strangers. For one California couple, tales of the young stranger were a ray of hope in the search for their 34-year-old son, Gordon Collins, who had been missing for five months. I know he's alive. We have our priority now to, to try to find him. And uh, I can't get on with my business. I can't get on with nothing until, uh, you know, we get him home. Inside your heart, you're just, you're always longing to just, to, to that day you're gonna be able to hold him and know it's for real. The strange saga of Gordon Collins began on April 19th, 1991. He was vacationing with his girlfriend, Anastasia Seals, and another couple near Santa Rosalia, a popular deep sea fishing spot midway down the Baja Peninsula. Four days after they arrived, the group secured a boat at a local hotel. Gordon's friend, Wayne Schwartz, had fished off the Baja coast many times and knew the area well. As the group left port, a fisherman on his way in warned them that a storm was brewing. The fisherman's warnings apparently went unheeded. Several hours later, a fierce storm would indeed hit the area. Gordon Collins and his friends never returned. The next day, a hotel employee was set out to search for them. His search ended 28 miles northeast. Wayne Schwartz and Gordon's girlfriend, Anastasia Seals, were dead. But Gordon Collins and Schwartz's wife, Arlene Burlington, were nowhere to be found. The bodies and all the paraphernalia out of the boat was all within one square mile of each other. Because I talked to the fellow that fished the bodies out. And, uh, and so and we say, well, hey, where's the other two jackets? And where's the other two people? For three days, the United States Coast Guard searched a 250-mile area of the Sea of Cortez on the Baja shoreline. Finally, they suspended the search, pending further evidence. Scott, you got anything on the left side? Uh, no, it seemed obvious that Gordon Collins and Arlene Burlington had perished. 
The U.S. consulate in Mexico asked Gordon and Arlene's parents to sign death certificates. However, reports that Gordon was still alive had already begun to filter across the border. His parents came to believe that he'd been picked up by a fishing boat and brought ashore. They were certain that Gordon was suffering from amnesia and was unable to find his way home. John and Mary Lou Collins traveled from Moreno Valley, California, to the area where the two bodies had been recovered. They combed Santa Rosalia, desperately hoping for a clue to Gordon's whereabouts. We got flyers made up. And uh, so we were spreading them all out when two Mexican fishermen come running up to us and uh, kept pointing to the, to the flyer. He said they seen a guy out of the water, come out of the water, he just had shorts and he was all cut up and waiting there at the, trying to get on the bus, sta bus there at the bus station. I was very excited. The thing started fitting together because this is where the accident happened. Uh, they found the bodies uh, just a mile and a half off of this shore. It's got to be Gordy. Around the same time, Gordon was also sighted on a nearby beach by a man named Jose Peralta. Can I have your blanket? Okay. Can I have your blanket? Uh, I'm cold. Savannah? Jose said that Gordy said he was waiting for friends he went fishing with. And could he have Jose's blanket because he was going to sleep on the beach there at Cabo and wait for his friends? Neither lead panned out, and the Collins returned home. It was the beginning of a frustrating, seemingly endless pattern. I would go down until I wouldn't get any more sightings. And then I'd go back home, and, and, uh, and we'd get a phone call or something. And, and so, boom, I'd get on a plane, and we'd head back on down and, and hit these areas where the siding was, uh, evidently was, was at. On one trip, we are headed toward La Paz, and we stopped at a few of these uh, taco places. And, uh, and they says, yeah, I've seen him an hour ago. So we went on down further, probably another three or four miles, and we stopped, stopped again. And the guy says, yeah, we've we seen him about 30 minutes ago. So we finally got right into town. And they says, yeah, within five minutes. And then they seen us all, seen us together. And I don't know what happened, but everybody just clammed up. We couldn't get no, we couldn't get no, uh, no more information. I don't know if they thought we were the... Uh, the police, the FBI, or the DA, or, or, or what, you know? And we couldn't get no more information, and bam, it was, it just stopped. Over the next three months, Gordon Collins was spotted at least 50 times in seven different locations, all in the area of La Paz and Cabo San Lucas, at the southern end of the Baja Peninsula. It almost seemed that Gordon Collins had wanted to disappear and might be hiding out but Gordon had called his parents the day he left for Mexico so they would know where he was. John and Mary Lou Collins are adamant that Gordon would never desert his 10-year-old son, Christopher, and cause his family such pain and suffering. I believe he can't remember what happened and cannot make the choice to return home because he doesn't know where you know, home is, and, and you can't leave your child wandering around in a country aimlessly. And not only were we exhausted, but our money was exhausted, and we began uh, to think we weren't doing it right. We decided we needed a professional at this point. The Collins hired Bill Garcia, a private investigator who alerted newspapers in Baja. After the articles ran, Garcia received several calls from the village of Colonia Vicente Guerrero. It was four or five months here in town. He never worked here, never worked. And he only hang around he, uh, and here in town. He was walking all the time, moved move too much here. And uh, almost in the town, everybody knows him. We've shown them pictures and everyone recognizes him. And they're positive that it's him. The people that have talked to him know, know some things about him, about Gordon and um, feel confident that he is there, or was there. According to Amador, Gordon was eventually arrested for stealing food. The local sheriff, or delegado, 
brought in James Hatfield, an American living in the village, to translate. Hello, my name's James. What's yours? Hi, I'm, I'm Gordy. Gordy, this tell I don't have something to say to you. There's no doubt in my mind it's Gordon, because when we met him in jail, I introduced myself to him, and he gave me his name, Gordon. And then when the flyer came out, it's right there on the flyer, Gordon. And you can't get the two pictures mixed up. It's the same. He moved on shortly before we were able to get to that area, and we haven't been able to find where he's gone from there. The Gordon seems to be just wandering through the different towns in Baja, not really knowing where he's going. I don't think he's attempting to get home because he seems to go north, then he seems to travel back south. Over the next year, sporadic sightings of Gordon continued. The last was near the village of Rosarita, 25 miles south of Tijuana. The U.S. consulate has now officially reversed its position and no longer presumes that Gordon Collins is dead. You just can't up and give up because it's your son. I know it keeps me driving and keeps me going, and I want to get him home, you know, to, to, to get him home safe and, and uh, back to normal again. Recently, we featured the story of W.B. Mac McDonald, a self-made millionaire who was searching for his heir, a child whom Mac had seen but once 43 years ago. Mac's story began in 1948 in Pomona, California. That summer, he fell in love with a 16-year-old girl named Mary Helen Carr. But their courtship was cut short by Mary Helen's mother. She threatened to have Mac arrested if the romance continued. My whole life was revolving around her. It upset me, you know, because I was in love with a girl and we were planning on a future together. And here were these uh, tremendous stumbling blocks being thrown out into the path. Mac moved to Houston, Texas. Three weeks later, Mary Helen ran away from home and joined him. Got a new neighbor. You did? Posing as husband and wife, the young lovers moved in together. But their happiness was short-lived. Hello? Just a minute. Who is it? I don't know. A friend tipped off Mac that the police were on the way to the apartment. Mary Helen's mother had made good on her threats. Authorities carried warrants charging Mac with statutory rape and illegally living with a minor. That's fine. I'll call you. Mac made his escape with no time to spare. I was devastated again. They jerked her back to uh, California. And I, hadn't, I had no way of contacting her again. A year later, Mac returned to California and was shocked to learn that he was a father. He visited Mary Helen and met his child for the first and only time. But fearing that authorities were still looking for him, Mac fled after only five minutes. He never even learned if the baby was a boy or a girl. Now a wealthy businessman, Mac wants to find the child he left behind 43 years ago. I feel that uh, the youngster's entitled to my estate. And I would wanna, I'd want that uh, youngster to know that I love them and I want them to have the best. The night of our broadcast, Mac McDonald learned that he had a daughter named Sherry. The long-awaited news came from a viewer in Dallas, Texas, Mary Helen Carr, Sherry's mother. Unlike many of the reunions we have featured, the end of this search evoked decidedly mixed emotions for Mac, for Mary Helen, and especially for their daughter, Sherry, who'd been raised by a loving and caring stepfather. I'm uh, 43 years old and pretty well set in my life and everything, and, and I didn't know what to think. You know, I'm very happily married and have two great kids, and, 
you know, and I'm, we just are a normal American family, and, and this is quite a shock to everyone. One week after our broadcast, Mac McDonald arrived at Sherry's home in Denver, Colorado. For Mac, the reunion would bring a bittersweet and at times unsettling reconciliation with the past. Hello. Come on in. Yes, hi, Mac. It's hard to describe the feeling that I had for my daughter when I opened the door and she was there and I was able to hold her. I just tried to come to the realization that it really was my father standing there. And I just, you know, does he, does he look like me? Does he act like me? You know, I have all these things I need to learn about him. I don't know what to say. I, I'm still in a state of shock. At this point in my life, to find that there is someone who is my father and who wants to establish a relationship with me, it's just emotionally very traumatic. Apparently, he wants to be part of her life. And if that's the case, it's OK. I hope since he's gone to this much effort to find her that he doesn't bring any sorrow to her. The fact that I didn't stay and fight the battle, it's most unfortunate. I don't believe I would do it that way again. However, Yesterday, unfortunately, can't be redone. I'd like to. No matter how you look at it, he left my mother with a, with a tiny baby, you know, and I have to deal with that. Um, I have to deal with the fact that I have a father who loves for me, who's raised me, who's cared for me, but I believe there's enough room in this family for everyone. And I sincerely mean that. On the afternoon of March 11th, 1992, paramedics were dispatched to an emergency at a toy store in Redwood City, California. Inside, sprawled on a table in the employee's lunchroom, was 23-year-old Gilbert Ortiz. He was sweating profusely and experiencing severe convulsions. Cramps in the stomach? Yeah. Gilbert, what did you drink? Did you drink or eat something? A shake. A shake. What's in a shake, Gilbert? Gilbert managed to tell the medics that he'd become ill after drinking a high-protein amino acid milkshake, commonly used by bodybuilders to help them bulk up and strengthen muscle. Gilbert, where did you get the shake from? Friend. A friend? Yeah. And how long ago did you drink this, Gilbert? Gilbert began to slip in and out of consciousness. His wife was contacted, and paramedics rushed him to nearby Sequoia Hospital. Is that the shake right there? Yes. Doctors in the emergency room were baffled by Gilbert's condition. They examined the plastic bottle, which had contained the shake, and set it aside so the contents could be tested later. Within moments, Gilbert's wife, Elizabeth, arrived in the emergency room. Doctors hoped that she could provide an explanation for Gilbert's sudden, mysterious illness. The paramedics just brought him over here just a few minutes ago, and they said that after taking that sports drink over there, about 15 minutes later, he started vomiting. He's very disoriented. I can't get anything straight out of him. Have you ever seen that bottle? No, never. I've never seen it. No. You know what we're thinking? We're thinking he might have had an overdose of drugs, maybe some street drugs or maybe something else. Gilbert doesn't do drugs. Are, are you sure? No, I'm, I'm serious. Okay. Gilbert doesn't do drugs. Okay. By 10 o'clock that evening, Gilbert had developed pneumonia and his kidneys had failed. He was admitted to the intensive care unit. He would later suffer cardiac arrest and slip into a coma. As his life hung in the balance, doctors worked feverishly to determine what had caused him to become so violently ill. Sometime that afternoon, the plastic milkshake bottle, similar to this one, mysteriously disappeared. It was a first in a series of bizarre incidents that would lead authorities to believe that Gilbert Ortiz had been poisoned by someone he thought he could trust. 
1987, Gilbert was serving in the Army when he met Elizabeth Fuentes. They married three years later, shortly after the birth of their son, Jonathan. Gilbert took an entry-level position in the toy store in Redwood City, but he and Elizabeth frequently fought over money. In March of 1992, Gilbert received a promotion and the future suddenly seemed brighter. Less than a week later, Gilbert was in the hospital fighting for his life. Gilbert's mother and sister soon joined Elizabeth at the hospital. They said that while they were in the waiting room, Elizabeth received a strange phone call which seemed to upset her. Yes, yes. Okay, bye. She got nervous when she came back from, from that phone call. I don't know why, I don't know what they told her. Well, I'm gonna go home and I think I should check on Jonathan. And uh, I need to get something made too. And so she decided that she was going to go see Jonathan, that she was concerned about Jonathan for some reason. And she was going to go to Gilbert's work because she knew the combination for the locker, and she was going to go see if she could find anything because Gilbert wasn't getting any better. He's got Jonathan. That man has Jonathan. Elizabeth, what's going on? And about two hours later, she came back. She was hysterical. And she kept saying, somebody has Jonathan. This, this guy has Jonathan. Jonathan, somebody has Jonathan. What happened? That man outside has Jonathan. What man? That man outside in the parking lot. He, he said he was going to hurt Jonathan. Wait, he has Jonathan outside? No, yeah, he's no. He, the man said he was going to kidnap him. Wait a minute. I thought Jonathan was with your mother. And so I, I was like, wait, gonna, your mom has Jonathan. To kidnap Jonathan. I'm going to call your mom. And I went and I called her mom. And... Her mom, you know, I asked her, you know, is Jonathan there? And then she's all like, yeah, he's, he's right here. I'm like, why? I'm like, because um, Elizabeth just said that some guy had him. While Brenda was on the phone, Elizabeth blurted out a disjointed, frightening story. She said she had been approached by a small boy in the hospital parking lot, who then directed her to a masked man in a parked car. Did you know him? No, he, he was wearing a mask. I couldn't see. What kind of mask? I don't know. I just covered his face. Couldn't see his face. What did, what did you do? What did he say? He said that he knew what had happened to Gilbert and that Gilbert had drank the wrong stuff. What? The stuff in the bag. He said Gilbert drank the stuff in the bag? Yeah. Inside the paper bag was a bottle of liquid insecticide. I'm calling the I don't police. Know. No, don't call, don't call the police. He said if you call the police, he was going to hurt Jonathan. I'm calling the police. The ICU nurse immediately made two phone calls, one to the National Poison Control Center and the other to the Redwood City Police. This is Sequoia Hospital. I have a poisoning to report. I need to speak to an officer. I don't know. I didn't see it after the paramedics. Five days later, Elizabeth was questioned about the mysterious masked man she said had handed her the insecticide. So tell me about the little boy that ran after you. Well, when I was in my car, I, um, I turned on my car and I was... Uh, for about the first hour of the interview, she maintained the story that she had given the officers and the nurses at the scene, stating that the man with the mask and a little boy. And she told me that she thought it was definitely a strange story, but it was the truth. Elizabeth, if what you're telling us is the truth, how would this guy have known that Gilbert drank this thing? How should I know? Well, how would the little boy know? I don't know. I don't know. I've never seen any of these people before in my life. Your story doesn't make sense. I just, I still couldn't believe what she was telling me. And so my partner and I started to jam her by, you know, telling her certain things to see how she would react, like we knew more than we actually did. And that man gave me the bottle. There was a witness in the parking lot. He didn't see a man with a mask, and he didn't see a little boy. All he saw was you. There was no masked man, and there was no little boy. OK. All right. OK. I made that part up. Why? Because the doctor, you know, he was, he said that whatever Gilbert drank was in the house, okay? And so I went, he asked me if I had any insecticides, and I looked, I searched in the house, and that's when I found the bottle. Well, why did you make the story up about the man with the mask and the little boy? Because I was scared. I didn't know if Gilbert had done this to himself on purpose. I she told me that maybe he was trying to hurt himself, and, and so I asked her, you mean you think he was trying to take his own life? And she said, yeah, maybe. Maybe he was depressed, and, and I didn't want him to get in trouble. Elizabeth, would you be willing to take a lie detector test? Look, I have a job interview, OK? So I got to go. What about the lie detector test? OK, when? Later this afternoon, after your interview. OK, I'll be back. 
Elizabeth never returned to the police station. The next morning, Detective Anderson reached her at her mother's house in San Francisco, 20 minutes from Redwood City. This time, Elizabeth refused to come in. Can you talk in. to your lawyer about it, please, and give me a call back? Gilbert, I'm going to ask you... 11 days question. later, okay. Gilbert regained consciousness, and police suspicions were finally confirmed. Gilbert had apparently been poisoned by his own wife. Uh, Elizabeth, she was working for some people, and she called me about 12 or so and, and told me she wanted to have lunch with me. Gilbert explained that Elizabeth had told him about a co-worker's son who had bulked up by drinking amino acid milkshakes. You know, I, I lift weights and all, but I, I, I could never get big, and that's the kind of guy she likes. Do you know this guy? No. Some guy she worked for. So she mixed something up and brought it for you to drink? No, no the guy, the guy mixed it up, gave it to her. She came to my work lunchtime and dropped it off. Gilbert said Elizabeth met him around 2 p.m. in the toy store parking lot. Hey. Hi. The shake was already mixed in a plastic sports bottle. I'm going to tell you to drink it before you eat anything. It smells like chocolate. What did you say was in it? Amino acid. They're supposed to make me stronger? Yeah. <laughs> this guy is real big. He's real buffed. And uh, he said it might taste a little nasty, but it's OK. It's supposed to. Well, actually, I didn't open it until I got inside. It looked like a real shake. I mean, like a real chocolate shake. That's what it looked like. So I kind of tried it, right? And then when I tried it, it sort of like burned my throat a little bit. I said, mm, maybe that's the way it's supposed to taste. I don't know. I don't know if it was supposed to be sour or, I don't know, spicy. Because it was spicy. But I thought that's the way it just was. And I kept drinking it and drinking it, but I didn't touch the food at all. And then pretty close, uh, I almost finished the bottle. And then I started feeling really hot. And my throat was really, 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 really burning. And I was all shaky. And then I felt like getting sick. Then I passed out. Then I was in the emergency room. Well, Gilbert, what I'd like to do... Police like obtained a search pass. warrant to see if they could trace the poison or the plastic bottle to Elizabeth. But when they arrived at the Ortiz apartment, they made a startling discovery. Elizabeth Ortiz had vanished, along with a couple's two-year-old son, Jonathan. Then that's when it hit me. She did it then. It really, really hurt it. You know, especially when it told me, I said, where's the baby? She, he's gone. That's, that's the main part that really got me. Her, you know, fine, she's gone, she's gone, but the kid, you know, I was too attached to the kid. DLM. Nearly one year has passed since Gilbert Ortiz was poisoned, but he still has not fully recovered. The insecticide caused serious damage to his liver and nervous system. His right foot is numb, and he has difficulty walking without assistance. Doctors don't know if I'm going to get back to normal or if it's permanent damage to my nerves. Same thing with my hands tip of my fingers, numbed, can't feel anything. And that really messed up my life because if I can't do anything with my feet, I can't work. Jonathan Fuentes Ortiz has not been seen since March 17, 1992. He was born on May 13, 1990, and has brown eyes and black hair. An arrest warrant has been issued for Elizabeth Fuentes Ortiz. The charge, attempted murder with a special consideration for torture. Elizabeth is 23 years old, five feet six inches tall and weighs 140 pounds. She has black hair, brown eyes and a prominent cleft in her chin.
On a previous broadcast, we featured the agonizing story of a young English woman, Delia Fazzani. In 1964, she was 18 years old, unmarried, and had just had a baby whom she named Michelle. At her father's insistence, Delia was staying at a convent until the baby was adopted. Two weeks after the baby was born, Delia's parents visited the convent. Delia hoped once her father saw Michelle, he would relent, but he wouldn't even look at his granddaughter. In the end, Delia had no choice but to give up her daughter for adoption. You've only got 30 minutes to say goodbye. What you try to do is look at her face to burn the impression into your mind. And so you feel the, um, the shawl and well, maybe because it's wool, but you're feeling her body because that was the last time you're gonna see her. And that was it. I can't explain it. One minute I had a baby, next minute it was gone. Two photographs were all that Delia had to remember Michelle, and she never stopped trying to locate her. Finally, after 15 years of frustrated research, Delia's efforts began to pay off. Last July, Delia learned that her daughter had been renamed Laura. An adoptions official agreed to send a letter to Laura that Delia had written. In the brief note, Delia said that she would soon appear in Unsolved Mysteries and asked her daughter to view the broadcast. 1964. Delia Fazzani sat in her... In New York Mills, New York, on the evening our program was aired, Delia's daughter, Laura Franklin, experienced firsthand the heartbreaking events leading up to her adoption. But he just didn't want the responsibility of it. That was just the way they did things then. They just... There she is! ...left the responsibility to go. When I found out my birth mother was searching for me, um, that was pretty touching to know that she had looked that far um, to try to find me. If you have any information, please call our toll-free number, 1-800-87653. After the broadcast, Laura contacted our telecenter and asked to be put in touch with her birth mother. Against nearly impossible odds, Delia had at last found her daughter, a continent away amidst a population of millions. On September 19th, 1992, Laura, her husband, their two children, and Laura's closest friends assembled at Syracuse International Airport. The separation of birth mother and daughter that had lasted more than a quarter of a century was about to end. It was a lot of anticipation, a lot of um, what's she gonna think when she sees me, and um, what is she going through right now? She was everything and more that I'd expected. Absolutely everything. She's a, she's a beautiful girl. Proud of her. Before Laura's adoptive mother died in 1989, she had shared all she knew of Laura's background. Delia and Laura could now fill in the remaining gaps in nearly 30 years of family history. Finding my birth mother um, now, I don't think it's really um, changed my life as much as it has probably enhanced it um, because now I can find out some about my past and my history and things that I never thought that I would ever find out about. I can't replace her mother, but I'd like to think that I could be pretty close. The September reunion is only a beginning. At Christmas, Laura and her family plan to travel to England where they will spend time with Delia and the many relatives looking forward to meeting them for the first time. Join me next time. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery.